coming up on Sleep, Eat, Perform, Repeat. This was in a storm now, like huge waves, six, seven, eight meter waves, and the boat's kind of going up the side of them because I'm not rowing anymore. I saw this flash out of the corner of my right eye, and it was the wave coming over the top of the boat, and I knew nanoseconds I'm I'm going over here with the boat. So I just instinctively grabbed the handle behind me, and I went in. So, the, so I knew, like, as long as I had one point of contact, I'd be good. This was the visualization I would have done a lot in regards to capsize, like good chance I'm going to capsize, good chance I'll be rowing, I'll see the wave coming, I'll drop the oars, I'll grab these two lines that run down either side of where I row called jack stays. And as long as I have one point of contact with that boat and as long as that doesn't break, I'll be safe. If I lose contact with that boat, that's it. It's it's over. Brown bread, it's game over, you know. Welcome to Sleep Eat Perform Repeat with your hosts David Clancy and Kieran Dunn. This is a podcast about high performance. What we are striving to achieve is to figure out what makes high-performing individuals tick, why they do what they do, and why they are successful. Enjoy a journey of stories, lessons, and learnings. Today we spoke with Damien Brown, adventurer of Project Empower. Damien Brown has just rowed 5,000 kilometers across the Atlantic Ocean from New York to Galway after 112 days at sea. An explorer, peak performer, and former professional rugby player. We actually spoke with Damien on this show in August 2020. What he's achieved up until that point and since is truly remarkable. Here he shared his story, tools he leans into, and exercises that help him navigate the most extraordinary physical and emotional journeys man has undertaken, such as this recent row. Damon spoke with us about visualization, living his masterpiece, and about his daily pursuit to challenge himself in all ways, both physically and mentally. Project Empower. Wow. What's next for you, Damon? Hi, Damien. Thanks for coming on the show. Where are you joining us from today and how are you doing? Uh, thanks for having me, Kieran. I am joining you from just outside Kinvara in County Galway and I'm, yeah, I'm doing very well. Thanks. I suppose give the listeners a little bit of an idea as to how you were doing kind of up until COVID and maybe how COVID has impacted you individually. Up until I think it was March 16th or 17th, it was around Paddy's Day anyway, um, Nepal, the country, uh, closed its mountaineering season, it clo- literally closed down mountains and its borders. And it was a massive blow to um, what I had been building up to because my plan was three weeks from then or even less, two and a half weeks from then, I was flying to uh, Kathmandu to um, start my attempt at uh, climbing Mount Everest. So the last, um, oh, how long was it? I was building up to that. Probably close to seven months I'd been training intensely. And uh, I was right at the peak of my kind of last training block, you know. So I was trying to uh, strip as much weight off me as I could. And I was trying to um, just get as much time on my feet um, in the mountains and on a thing called the Versa Climber, which is like an indoor climber, you know. So it was, it was just, it was a massive blow because you, you forecast a lot around these sort of things. So it's not just the fact that you're, you know, going to spend two months on a mountain, but it's everything after that that you've kind of um, set in place and forecasted would happen. And it was just the unforeseen of that, you know. I just, I, I, you know, nobody, I know nobody saw what was, what came coming. Um, and I was, I was in that big group as well. You know, I didn't see it coming. So I wasn't prepared to be honest with you. <laughs> I don't think anyone really was unless you're some sort of conspiracy theorist. Um, so yeah, I, listen, it was just a case of rolling with the punches and, and, uh, kind of controlling what I could control. And, you know, I could control how I, um, perceived that and how I, um, reacted to it. I felt I reacted quite positively, but um, COVID has been, um, it has been a challenge, I must say. It has thrown, um, after that, it has thrown many more uh, little blips and hurdles at me and at our, uh, me and my girlfriend. But listen, we're, uh, we're good. You know, we're good. We're, um... and, and Damon, just, just for the listeners to give a bit of context, 
obviously you'll, you'll have pivoted because Everest has been parked for a while, but give, give the listeners a little bit of an idea as to where Everest came into your grand scheme because it was, it was part of something that you've been obviously working on for a while. In 2018, I um, finished a solo and unsupported row across the Atlantic. Um, and I was, well, once I felt, which was, you know, well, I was going to say once I felt that, that I had achieved that feat, which was only about two days before I actually got to the end, I felt, okay, I think I'm going to get there now at least, you know, and nothing's going to stop me. You start to think about, you know, well, what's next? And I had a couple of ideas in my head. The first one was to do another ocean row from uh, the opposite way across the Atlantic, so from um, North America to Europe. So there's basically two ways you can go. I went from um, the Canary Islands, um, so across the southern North Atlantic, so just north of the equator, so from the Canary Islands to Antigua. But you can also go back the other way um, because of a thing called the Gulf Stream. You can go from uh, North America, normally Canada, but some people go from um, Boston, New York area, and they can carry you to uh, the UK and mainland Europe. So that was in my head, but there was another, um, the other option that I felt that I Basically, the other option that scared me the most and the one that was in the back of my mind was Mount Everest. Um, and because of that kind of fear, because of that um, resistance, because of the trepidation, that's the one I chose. But I, I felt like I had a lot to learn. Like I had done a few mountains in the past, like Kilimanjaro, Mount Blanc, uh, Grand Paradiso, but nothing uh, particularly um technical or um, challenging and you know as we hear every year that's what um, gets uh, Mount Everest a lot of bad press people going into it unprepared and you know that's one thing I definitely um, advocate is preparing you know for the worst Um, so I wasn't going to do that so what I thought was well there's another thing called the seven summits which is the highest mountain on each continent and the great thing about the seven summits is that it's almost like a leading um uh, learning kind of journey to get you to upskill by the time you get to Mount Everest. So, you know, Everton is nearly like, or sorry, there's um, about five mountains on that list that are kind of a step up in in um, difficulty every time. So by the time you've got them all done, you're, you've nearly had this amazing experience by going around the world to different continents and, you know, summiting their highest peak. But you've also learned how to um, be as prepared as possible for high altitude mountaineering and to take on something like Mount Everest. So that's what I committed to. I committed to doing the seven summits. And um, yeah, up until that point in um, March this year, uh, I was facing into number six on my list, which was Mount Everest. So I had completed uh, Mount Elborus, uh, which is in Russia. It's Europe's highest I completed Aconcagua in Argentina, which is South America's highest. I completed Denali in Alaska, which is North America's highest. And I had summited um, one called Karsten's Pyramid, which is in um, uh, an amazing part of the world called West Papua. So it's the western half of the island of uh, Papua New Guinea. And um, that is the oceanic continent's highest mountain, which is, um, yeah, which was some experience. So so basically that was um from kind of uh, may 2018 up until march this year that was ha- what i had been working at you know trying to achieve trying to get to the highest point on each continent so having completed some of them already and you're talking preparation which ones threw up the most surprises or most challenges and what were them challenges that you maybe couldn't have predicted or couldn't have prepared for they all they all held like I, there was no mountain where I came off it saying um, that was grand. You know, there was no mountain that didn't impose some sort of stress or struggle on me. So, you know, on Mount Elberus, which was my first, so I'd done Kili, so I wasn't, uh, I'd done Kilimanjaro in Africa while I was still playing rugby. So I wasn't really, I wasn't keen on heading back. I'd done it once and, you know, it was hard enough the first time. So I really didn't want to give it another go. So Mount Elberus was my first mountain. Uh, on that mountain, I, you know, I had some poor choices around gear. Um, I had the kind of shock nearly of um, 
feeling my hands. Um, now, I, I didn't, I didn't come near to frostbite, but you know, I had no reference what frostbite was or fr- um, frost nip. You know, so when your hands are cold for a few hours, you get very stressed because all you think about is this, is this ish, is this frostbite? You know, so I remember that's a, a huge amount of emotional energy to use up. And when you're like my size, like so, I'm not built for mountaineering. I'm a hundred and walk around 120, one or two kilos, a bit lighter now um um, but you know that's a huge amount that takes a huge amount of energy to drag that sort of weight up a mountain um and you know i'm taught it's really a razor edge stuff here and if you're using energy like it's so valuable up there just to you know you'd be using your energy to concentrate on your breathing and your as be as efficient as possible with your movement at that weight so if you're using it up um stressing um over something like that you know mentally it's very taxing so that that was a that was a long battle uh, internally, and I was never in any danger in terms of getting frostbite, but I didn't know that at the time, you know. Um, so that was Elbrus. Aconcagua was um, more the height. I'd never been to that height before, so it was just under 7,000 meters. And, you know, things went really well um, for the first kind of up until summit day and again summit day was a struggle you know it was a real battle internal battle um but eventually got there you know i'm i'm, I'm always again because of my size i'm kind of always one of the slowest in my group you know so that that does um add a little bit of stress because i don't, I don't know if it's just an irish thing but you get a little bit kind of um Ooh, I suppose worried or anxious that you're kind of slowing the group down, you know. So again, it's just a wasted energy. Denali was just I made a mistake on um the 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 biggest battle I had on Denali. And Denali was like it was just the most magnificent mountain I've ever been on. It was so, so beautiful. And I was loving the experience and up until um summit day again i just the thing about denali that um kind of catches you from other mountains that you've been on is that you know on every other mountain i've lived on and i experienced you get to camp and um everything is done for you by porters or guides you know so you just have to rest and recuperate but on denali there is no porter so you carry everything yourself so when we got to a uh, high camp um, we were going pushing for the summit the next day we had to make camp so you had to build a platform for tents and you have to set up the tents and you know we had a couple of members of our, our group that were struggling that day and I didn't, it's just the person I am you know I, I'll take on the extra work no problem you know I'll, I'll always kind of it's just in my beliefs that I would do that so um, that's what I did but I didn't refuel well enough that night then and I was very dehydrated and very kind of um under fueled come this morning of the summit and i knew within half an hour walking that it was going to be a really really tough day you know um i just didn't have the energy i hadn't re- recovered anywhere near um what i would like to have and it was just a massive battle for the next whatever nine hours i think it took to get to the summit eventually got there but it, there was a hell of a lot of doubts there was a hell of, hell of a lot of a questioning uh, throughout that and, and to be honest i'm not even sure i have seven, haven't even processed some of it and uh, we're talking a year later um and then the last mountain that i've done was karsten's pyramid which was in august um last year and you know karsten's is a um, technical rock climb now um I was a little bit, you know, I'm, I'm not a technical climber. I don't have hardly any experience at it. So I was a little bit uh, apprehensive about that, but I absolutely loved that experience. I I relished um, the the kind of primal nature of pulling yourself up a mountain um, by your hands. And, by, you know, so what I didn't expect was we were actually waiting about, we ended up waiting 11 days to fly onto the mountain because of, mm-hmm. it's yeah, it's based in, um, it's very complicated well it's it's based in um above a mine um that's owned by this you know multinational corporation um now they have they basically control half the island so they tell you when you can fly and when you can't and then the helicopter pilots the approach is quite difficult into the um base camp landing area like it goes through um 
I would say a kind of 60 to 70 meter gap in the mountains. So uh, basically, we sat around the hotel for 11 days in a little town called Tamika looking at clouds because that's all there was. And the helicopters would not fly if there was any clouds or winds. So it was incredibly frustrating um, because all you think about is like, a, you know, I'm here. Um, it's not looking good. Every day you wake up and they make a call by 9 a.m. if you're going up or not. And then you got the rest of the day to ha- like there's literally nothing to do there. It's It's a mining town that's, you know there's nothing to do so you're thinking like there's a good chance i mightn't even get up because our permits were running out and we you know you paid money to be there so you're thinking um i might have to come back to do this so it was quite quite frustrating at times um there was a few days we got driven to the um, airport where the helicopters took off from and waited around for a few hours and then had to drive back so (laughs) that was uh to answer your question kieran that was definitely an unexpected challenge of that um that particular mountain and damien when stuff isn't going to plan like you obviously learn so much about yourself you obviously have to call from within something to get you through those times when you're stressed or anxious or you're parked for 11 days waiting or you're having that in Denali or you're maybe there's a bit of self-doubt creeping in like what do you what's that inner self-talk all about that dialogue for you get back to what you can control you know that is something you can do so like for example we were hanging around Tamika I just made it my priority to have an outlet for my energy you know and that was something I could look at at control. And so I just kind of trained every day. You just do your best with what you have. We had nothing in this little hotel, but like I'd find a way to get a good session done where I would, you know, I would challenge myself. Um, and if I felt I had that done, like that's always a big thing for me. That's a big outlet. So um, the, the rest of the day, I would kind of just, again, just what what am I here to do? I'm here to climb this mountain. So what do I have to do to be as prepared for that? Well, I can... I can eat well, I can eat, make smart choices, you know, and not let this um, situation uh, send me down a negative kind of habit path that will just manifest if the mountain does come about, you know. So so that was that was simply my thinking. But like when I think about the really stressful moments on mountains, it's just about controlling the controllables. And I know everyone's heard it and they're probably rolling their eyes. Oh God, here we go. But to be honest with you, we're not rolling them, Damon. We're not. Okay. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's the truth. It's absolutely the truth. You know, there's, um, there's a number of things I've discovered that I can control in those moments uh, that always bring me back. What they do is, so basically it's having the self-awareness about what you're saying to yourself and just bringing your mind back under your control by concentrating on one of these controllables. And, you know, this is, this is paramount to me. This is kind of my um, process that I go to whenever I am aware of, um, you know, negativity or, um, you know, that, that kind of uh, destructive chatter or um, uh, the dark moments or the really, really tough spots you know so and it's just controlling like so there's four things i always go to so like if i'm on a mountain a big part of that would be you know you're going to be in you are in a very stressful um physical state because the lack of oxygen and the demands on your body so you're always in that kind of hyperventilating state you're always struggling to control that so once that's out of control your mind's going to be out of control so what i just look at doing is bringing it back to that things that are in my control like my body position and technique and is that as perfect as it can be down to the finest details so i'd be like concentrating on the smallest finest details of you know my um be it whatever position is needed at that time be it walking be it trekking be it climbing of you know my ankles or my hips are they moving as efficiently as possible is you know am i nice and um, braced and solid and controlled through my trunk that's connecting you know so just that i am being as efficient with my energy which will in turn lead to me being uh, in the best position possible to achieve what I want to achieve. So, you know, position and technique is always my number one that I go to. And after that, then it is uh, effort. So um, you can always control your effort. So on a mountain, it's a little bit different because you're looking for less effort because you put on ocean rows or on um, 
you know, other stuff I've done, like runs, you know, ultra marathons through deserts, I'm looking at putting down more effort. And, you know, when I concentrate on my effort, when I, you know, use the right cues and questionings around that, it just brings me back to something what is in my control, which brings me back to the present moment, which once I'm present, I can't be stressed or I can't be anxious. Uh, third one is breath and the fourth one is self-talk so they're nearly like in a list of a hierarchical list that i go to you know position and technique i would say i use about 70 75 percent of the time and it's only in really 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 bad dark uh positions that i end up going down into self-talk and you know having a good word with myself because <laughs> that is all that is also something i can control uh you know what what side of me am i feeding am i uh, feeding like um the courageous side the positive side or am i feeding the negative side the draining side the weak side the lazy side you know that's within my control at all times so um you know if you can hit on some really positive self-talk or um it's just uh, emotional self-talk stuff that really penetrates for you and really ignites for you uh, that just switches your state um and that's what you need when in those really dark moments it's clear to see you're very self-aware and it's obviously something you've built. You mentioned on your website and you've said it before in a few interviews, your mission in life is to live one of integrity, sincerity and courage. Where did those values, where are they born from? I think a lot of them have been, um, it's been an evolution in language. So they came from rugby, like rugby was I can't express how important it was to me, what it made of me as a person, the demands that the um, people in rugby that I rub shoulders with, coaches, um, players, fellow players, the people I looked up to in rugby, you know, when I was a young guy, the uh, environments I was lucky enough to be in and also the ones I was unlucky enough to be in, like the really shit ones, you know. I think they're like a, they're a patchwork of that and just the sport itself and the integrity that the sport um, is is cultural in the sport and is demanded and is upkept in the sport. And, you know, I, as, as time went on and that became more of a um, – I became more of a self-driven person rather than been driven by the – um, by the environments, by others, um, I started to figure out the language or the, sorry, maybe I started to articulate these um, values that had been forged in me. Um, and I'm sure, you know, I, I off the top of my head, I, I don't, um, I haven't thought about this deeply, but I'm sure it goes back further than that. I'm sure it goes back into, you know, a positive uh, family environment growing up, um, but you know, rugby, I, I can't, like I said at the start, I just, I, I can't, it's impossible for me to be able to, um, articulate how much, how important that sport was to me and how demanding it was. You know, I was, I was forged by it. I was, I was literally, um, uh, molded by the pressures and the stress of the sport. Um, but it was something I always had a, I always looked on it positively. I always I built a very positive association with stress um, when I was younger, and I think it's just been deepened and deepened and deepened over the years. And I've always I've always stepped towards stress. I've not stepped away from it. You know, I've always embraced it. I've always uh, self imposed it. Uh, and as time went by, um, yeah, I just started to understand that um, these values were ones that the um, the training and the environments were um, demanding and they were ingraining and they were part of me. And just to flip that, Damien, now that you're, let's say, a full-blooded, experienced adventurer and traveler going around taking over all these interesting expeditions, is there anything that that form of Damien Brown would say to the 25-year-old rugby player? So you've played in France, you've played for Leinster, you've played for a lot of different teams over that rugby career. So is there anything from now that you would tell a younger rugby playing version of yourself? Oh, so much. I mean, I have, I have so many tools now that I regret I didn't have when I was playing rugby. You know, even when I think about my, like the rugby environment, it's, it's survival of the fittest. And you don't, a lot, I, I can't speak for everyone, but from what I saw when I was a professional rugby player, Nobody has a, 
uh, Scoobies about um, mental strength processes, resilient pro, just tr- mental training generally, or you know, and I didn't either. It was just you. You stay in there because you were. It's so important to you. You know, you 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 have such a um, purpose behind what you're doing that it, you know, y- you will you will survive. You will find a way to survive. But now I know so much more that I wish I kind of would have been able to give myself because I am, I am quite a process driven person, you know, and when I see one, when I can see one, when I know the steps and when I can train it, um, it gives me so much more confidence because I am prepared. Whereas with rugby, I was quite inconsistent. You know, I, I had a great game in me, but I also was inconsistent because mentally I was inconsistent. So I would have loved to have that, I would have also loved to have a lot of my reframing kind of skills that I have now. You know, I was, um, I was, I had too much of an ego that cost me um, probably going further in my career. Um, I was too reluctant to, and that ego stopped me from uh, change. It stopped me from embracing what was right for me. It 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 um, produced resistance against. Uh, forces that were just trying to teach me better and I probably had a fear of success as well you know there was something in me that um, again um, in a self-sabotaging nature stopped me from um, going further in my career so um, even the even the self-awareness I have now um, I think would have uh, projected me or would have uh, pushed me past those things and I would have probably gone further in my career um, but yeah, like I, there's just, and I'm not even getting into details here on how to train, how to look after yourself better, um, you know, how to eat better, like all these things that have um, evolved with me because of, I suppose, my um, the importance, the importance they hold for me, you know. So I'm always looking to make them better, better, better. So like, I'm five years retired now, and I would say. Uh, and I, I and I and I prided myself on my professionalism, and I was I was a good I was I felt I was a really good pro, but I I'd be a much much better pro now from everything I've learned, just by taking that kind of just by having that and taking that full responsibility um, over the last five years in my training, in my mental prep, in my emotional uh, side, you know, just growing as a person. Um, but I suppose you know you get as far as you get, you get as far as you deserve, you know, so. Um, I don't, you know, I, that's, I I accept that and I I don't have any regrets around that. A message you gave before, which I thought was brilliant, was about visualization, how you try and picture where you're going and you go to the dark places of what might happen, what challenges might arrive. It sort of has its links to stoicism that you prepare for the worst in in order to experience it. So it's not as bad when it comes around. Do you want to just tell us a bit about that process for you? Sure. When when do we need to be prepared for? Like when do we need um, to be uh, prepped? When do we need mental strength? It's always when the shit is about to hit the fan, or when you've got a basically a, a punch in the face you weren't expecting. Be that you know, be that a kind of your the gloves you have and not been prepared for. Um, the mountain not been of the top, the better the best quality so you have cold hands so you're panicking or you know on day one i remember never forget day one of my atlantic row like i mean just everything went wrong that could go wrong from you know from the conditions to um mistakes i made in my in my last minute preparations and it was just i i it was one of the darkest places i've ever one of the most confusing and destructive states i've ever found myself in due to the importance of um uh, the the challenge the expedition that I was on but like I was prepared for those moments because I had visualized myself in that state getting that shock through my nervous system you know getting that fear uh, and just you know I, I know what to do uh, in that moment because not only have I trained it um, but I have visualized it happening and I am um, um, it then it's just like well I've lived the experience before so it's never as bad I remember when I capsized on um, on day 14, I had two capsizes and the second one I was out on deck and I had, um, I was having trouble with my steering system. So that I was trying to fix it. That meant I was on a, um, 
unusual part of the boat so i was kind of trying to get in underneath the foot paddle to see what was wrong and see if i could remedy the or have a solution to the problem and i i was kind of it was in this was in a storm now like so you're talking huge waves six seven eight meter waves and the boat's kind of going up the side of them because i'm not rowing anymore or it's going up the waves the face of the wave sideways uh, and then I just came out of that position. I was kind of uh, crouched down and I, I lifted up because it's just basically my legs were um, fatiguing. You know, they were spasming from being in that position for ages. Uh, and just as I was coming up, I saw this flash out of the corner of my right eye. Um, and it was the wave coming over the top of the the boat. And I knew like nanoseconds, I'm, I'm going over here with the boat. The boat's going over, I'm going over. So I just instinctively grabbed the handle behind me and uh, I went in. So the boat went, The boat. these boats are designed to self-right. So I knew like as long as I had one point of contact, uh, I'd be good. And this was the visual, visualization I would have done a lot due to, or sorry, in regards to capsize. Like, so I was thinking, good chance I'm going to capsize, good chance I'll be rowing, I'll see the wave coming, I'll drop the oars, I'll grab these two uh, lines that run down either side of where I row uh, called jack stays. And as long as I have one point of contact with that boat and as long as that doesn't break, I'll be safe because if I lose contact with that boat, that's it. It's 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 over, brown bread. It's game over, you know. So so the, my this was my visualization and I ran it over and over again down to the – building that neural link between um, my mind and squeezing my grip, squeezing my grip. And I used to just say that to myself over, over again, you know, if I went into the water, just squeeze your grip, squeeze your grip. And guess what happened when I went in the water? I should have been in panic, right? I should have been in absolute chaos, but it was serenity. And uh, serenity, I, I mean that truthfully, like it was so, now it was, I was going from a storm to underwater. So you did have that effect of going from madness to obviously the, you know, silence of underwater. But internally, I was just in this very calm state. And I just remember saying to myself, and I'm hanging on to the boat now with one hand, and it's going 180 degrees underwater. And I just remember saying to myself, calmly, squeeze your grip, squeeze your grip. And I remember that, um, that link between the message I was sending to my brain and my uh, my fist and my grip strength getting stronger and stronger and eventually I came back and hit the uh, the boat uh, rewrite it and then I kind of was nearly solo or um, lassoed um, kind of arse over tit back onto the deck um, <laughs> and I just remember thinking to myself holy shit that worked that actually worked you know because I had no <laughs> idea <laughs> I had no idea. I was like, I remember in my training, like there's no Google search for what happens in a um, a capsize. And I just tried to visualize it as clearly and down to as much detail as I could and how, I'd, how I would react if I capsized. And then it all came to pass, which is mental enough. And um, And then not only that, but like what I had worked on, what I just kind of put into my own head thinking this this could be the solution actually worked really well i just remember being an absolute all oh, like even to this day i'm still kind of just the power that was the that was my clearest um uh uh connection ever with the power of visualization you know just because of the extremes of the situation i think and that like you, you're helpless as in you don't have any help you're completely unsupported there's nobody else to rely on so you have to be prepared for everything uh, and just the fact that i kind of i don't know came up with this visualization that actually worked like basically saved my life you could say um yeah i'm still in awe of it as are we did you did you visualize if a great white shark came came around you <laughs> yeah visualize crawling into the cabin and closing the door <laughs> stayed, as, <laughs> stayed as far away from it as i possibly can damien look you're you're inspiring a lot of people you're showing what the human body kind of mind and heart can can go through it's a testament to you and i mean words saying you're you're kind of living your own masterpiece are are strong words to say but they're there's something you seem to be somewhat embodying can you maybe just go into it a little bit for us it's a mindset you know i've actually had a bit of pushback around that from time to time and i just try and explain to people like it's a mindset you know it's 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 like looking back from the end of your life and looking upon your body of work and i i i look at that now i visualize that now as something that 
is incredibly satisfying, um, incredibly fulfilling, incredibly um, courageous of me to have gone and done, you know. So if I if I'm ever a little bit um, cloudy or foggy in my thinking, if I can just go to that place and have that um, visualization looking back from my deathbed and, and feel the emotion that that brings up in me, uh, that just rids me of all cloud or all confusion or whatever you want to call it, you know, or doubt or resistance or reluctance to commit to it or take action on something. Um, and it's just such a driver for me. It's such a motivator. And I really, I, the words, um, resonate with me a little bit, you know, that whole, even though it's, it might sound a little bit, um, oh, what would you say? self um important or something but it's not meant like that it, it's just it's a it's a it's a it's an attitude it's a mindset it's a it's a driver for me um and it gets me um it builds it, it uses my emotion and and you know emotion is energy so it um it ignites energy um at times when it's needed this is a question we ask everybody that comes on the show and from a 16 year career in professional rugby uh, someone who's going to try and climb the highest peaks on every continent you're a great person to ask damien so what does high performance mean to you it means finding a way to be the best version of yourself it means constantly striving for more from yourself and constantly looking open-mindedly at what others are doing and then engaging that and then or if you want engaging that and um, using that to continually push yourself forward expand yourself physically mentally emotionally spiritually just never it basically means never give up it means continue to strive for more from yourself excellent damien brown Myself, David Clancy and Kieran Dunn beside me are really grateful that you gave us the time today to talk about everything you've gone through and, and not even everything you've, you're going to take on. Um, you're a huge inspiration to so many people, not just the two of us. Thanks for opening up, sharing some really interesting stories. And we're both looking forward to seeing you, some photos of you at the top of the highest mountain in the world. Thank you very much, David. I appreciate it. And, and Kieran, thanks for the invite. And uh, that was great. Cheers, Damon. Take care. Cheers. Thanks, lads.